Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the basics of hemolysis. Now, we have already discussed the non-hemolytic normocytic anemias, and from this lecture on, we're going to be discussing the hemolytic normocytic anemias. Now, before we do that, we need to discuss hemolysis in general so you guys have a better understanding and a good concrete uh, foundation for the hemolytic anemias that we're going to discuss in the upcoming lectures. Now, if you guys don't know, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash madmedicine, you can find all of our hematology oncology lectures in a playlist. And while you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It'll really help us out. You guys' support means a lot to us, especially because we post brand new uh, USMLE Step 1 videos every day. So with that being said, let's discuss hemolysis. Hemolysis is the rupturing of red blood cells and the release of the contents into circulation. That's all that's happening. The red blood cells are lysing, and uh, you have a release of their intracellular concentration into the plasma, into the bloodstream. Now, there are two main types of classifications when it comes to hemolysis. The first type is the extrinsic versus the intrinsic uh, hemolysis classification. In this classification, you have intrinsic hemolysis where you have problems within the cell, and those problems within the cell are going to lead to the cell lysing and bursting. And then you have problems with the outside of the cell, so that is going to be extrinsic hemolysis. These are going to be issues that are occurring in the blood vessels and in the uh, organs especially. Anything outside of the cell that's going to lead to hemolysis. This can also be caused by viruses and uh, other issues like that. Now the that's the first type of classification. The second type of classification is not based off of the cell, right? The first right here was based off of the cell uh, is it if it's inside or outside. The second type is based off of the location, and that's going to be intravascular or extravascular. So let's just write that down. That's going to be the location of hemolysis. So in intravascular hemolysis, the lysis is going to occur within the vasculature, within the circulatory system. That is what's happening. And in extravascular hemolysis, it's going to occur outside. The lysis will occur outside like the spleen primarily. That's one of the main places it will occur. And that's something you need to know. Now, one thing to understand is that a lot of times the intracellular problems, the problems that are happening within the cell, are going to lead to issues that are going to cause extravascular hemolysis, right? And then the issues that are occurring outside of the cell or extrinsic hemolysis is going to be due to intravascular uh, hemolysis. So they're actually opposite and it's very easy to get them mixed up. So spend a little bit of time in this slide just so you guys can uh, solidify the fact that intrinsic, extrinsic hemolysis are opposite of intravascular and ext extravascular hemolysis. So when it comes to these conditions, we're going to first start talking about ext extravascular hemolysis. We're going to focus most on the vasculature because it'll let you know majority of the issues that are associated with it. So let's talk about extravascular hemolysis. This is mainly going to occur in the liver and spleen, and it's going to lead to uh, several different findings, especially hepatosplenomegaly in cases of continuous and uh, constant hemolysis occurring. Now, the liver is going to receive a very large amount of your uh, uh, cardiac output, and because of the fact that's going to relieve, it release. Uh, sorry, it's going to receive a lot amount of our cardiac output. It's going to remove severely damaged red blood cells easily. It's simply because it's getting a lot of the red, a lot of the volume of blood via the portal system. And uh, in order for it to function, in order for it to do its job, it's going to take away anything that's abnormal with the red blood cells uh, as part of its day-to-day -day normal function. Now that's the liver. The spleen is going to destroy the deformed red blood cells via a, uh, a mechanism within itself, and it's based off of this structure. It's called the cords of Billroth. Now these cords of Billroth function as a kind of sieve. They allow for proper uh, red blood cells to form, right? And the, uh, and the reason why it lets the proper red blood cells go through the cords of Billroth is because normal red blood cells can deform, they can change their shape slightly in order to pass through the cords of Billroth, but the abnormal or deformed red blood cells cannot. So for example, if you think about normal red blood cells, you have this circular shape with a, a location of central pallor. They can kind of deform like this and then they will be able to go back to the normal shape. But if you have something like sickle cell anemia, right, you have a sickling of the red blood cell, it's not really going to be able to change. It's just going to stay sickled. And that's going to lead 
to uh, them getting stuck in the cores of Bill Roth, and then the red pulp of the spleen, where all this occurs, is going to be able to get rid of these abnormally shaped red blood cells, and you're going to have extravascular uh, hemolysis occurring. Again, extravascular hemolysis is closely associated with intrinsic hemolysis, intrinsic causes of hemolysis. So in this issue right here in red blood cells, sickling of the red blood cells, you have a... Uh, a, a um, uh, issue with the cell membrane. It's mainly based off of the fact that in the beta chain, the hemoglobin chain, you're going to have a valine to glutamic acid substitution, and that's going to cause uh, abnormal uh, uh, hemoglobin to precipitate. And that's an intracellular issue that's happening. It is an intrinsic hemolytic problem. Now, when it comes to extravascular hemolysis, you're going to see normal haptoglobin. Remember, haptoglobin is the molecule that binds to hemoglobin in the bloodstream if, you, if it finds hemoglobin floating freely. Normally, hemoglobin is not floating freely in the bloodstream. It is always within red blood cells. So if you see haptoglobin, you're going to see it mainly in intra intravascular hemolysis. Now, with extravascular, because everything is happening in the liver and the spleen, you're not going to have an outflow of hemoglobin into the bloodstream, and therefore, you're not going to see haptoglobin levels rising. You're going to see normal haptoglobin. You will see spherocytes. You will not see hemoglobin urea or hemosiderin urea. Makes sense because you do not have hemoglobin or uh, hemosiderin flowing in the bloodstream, and this can present with urobilogen in the urine. That is one thing you should know. It can present in your ability in the urine. This is uh, a common finding for both intravascular and extravascular hemolysis. Now, when it comes to intravascular hemolysis, you are going to see uh, this type of hemolysis occurring within the blood vessels. And in the large blood vessels, we call this macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And in the small blood vessels, you guessed it, we call it microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Now, this is mainly going to do uh, several things. It can be due to uh, mechanical trauma, so like a mechanical heart valve that can lyse red blood cells. It can be caused by narrowing of the blood vessels. It can be caused by small vessel thrombus, a thrombus in the red blood cell that is causing a, uh, uh, it, which is lysing the red blood cell, or it can be caused, like I said, with mechanical heart valves. That's very similar to mechanical trauma. Now, when it comes to intravascular findings, they're going to be a little bit different than the extravascular findings because of the fact that in intravascular hemolysis, you are lysing the red blood cells, and because you are lysing these red blood cells, you're going to see the byproducts of the lysing in the blood, and that's going to mean you're going to see schistocytes. Schistocytes are also known as helmet cells and these are cells that are floating in our bloodstream that have been lysed and they don't look like a normal red blood cell they look kind of like this kind of like a triangle in a sense so those are schistocytes you're also going to see a significant decrease in haptoglobin why are you going to see a significant decrease in haptoglobin well when you lyse your red blood cells you have hemoglobin floating around and because you have intravascular hemolysis happening you're going to have a lot of hemoglobin which is going to bind to haptoglobin and that binding is going to decrease or deplete your haptoglobin concentration in your vasculature, in your uh, in your serum that normally is there. And therefore, you will see a significant decrease in haptoglobin. You are also going to see an increase in unconjugated bilirubin. Why is that the case? Well, if you think about it, you're going to have heme, heme and hemoglobin floating in your uh, blood. And because you have this heme, your body is going to start to process heme like it normally does. It's going to break it down into biliverdin and then into unconjugated bilirubin. Now, when it gets into the unconjugated bilirubin state, eventually that unconjugated bilirubin is going to go to your liver and it's going to be conjugated with gluta uh, gluco uh, glucuronic acid, excuse me, with the help of UGT. Now, overall, because you have such a high amount of hemoglobin and heme in circulation and unconjugated bilirubin, not all of that unconjugated bilirubin is going to be conjugated because it's going to overwhelm the liver capacity to do it. And based off of that issue, you're going to have unconjugated bilirubin stay high. You're also going to see hemoglobin urea. You're going to have hemoglobin in your urine and hemosiderin urea, as well as urobilinogen in the urine. Now that makes sense because because of the fact that you are still going to be conjugated some portion of that hemoglobin that's being uh, secreted, um, you're going to have some conjugated bilirubin. That conjugated bilirubin is going to go to the intestines, get converted into urobilogen. But because you have so much uh, conversion of that conjugated bilirubin into urobilinogen, it's going to be secreted in the urine. 
as well. So that's why intrinsic and uh, sorry, intravascular and extravascular hemolysis findings are going to be a little bit different. Now let's talk about schistocytes. This is what schistocytes look like. As you can see, this is a blood smear, red blood smear, and right here you can see these little platelets or these little fragments of red blood cells. And the classic finding of a schistocyte is this right here. This molecule that I've circled right here, this thing, this is a schistocyte also known as a helmet cell. This is what a schistocyte looks like. These are fragments of red blood cells that are usually caused by hemolysis. This is associated with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia or uh, macroangiopathic, any type of hemolytic anemia, DIC, TTP, HUS. The HELP syndrome can also lead to this. Uh, P and H paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, as well as mechanical hemolysis due to prosthetic heart valves. Pretty much this is a symbol of hemolysis. This is a sign of uh, intravascular hemolysis that is occurring. Now, when it comes to hemoglobin, and the last thing that you need to know for this uh, video, uh, for this lecture, is going to be a haptoglobin. This is a plasma protein that binds to free hemoglobin. It is usually circulating in our body in the plasma, and when it sees free hemoglobin, especially in states of hemolysis, it's going to bind to that uh, bind to that molecule, and you're going to see decreased levels of haptoglobin. This is produced by the liver, and uh, in cirrhosis, you're going to see decreased levels of haptoglobin, which makes sense because cirrhosis affects the liver, and liver produces a lot of proteins, mainly haptoglobin, uh, for this conversation and it's going to be decreased in levels uh, when it comes to cirrhosis. This is also acts as an acute phase reactant. Keep that in mind. Usually this will happen in abnormal states and you, you're going to see haptoglobin levels high. Now, haptoglobin and hemoglobin complexes are removed by the liver because uh, they're going to go to the liver as part of our circulation. And you're going to see decreased haptoglobin in hemolytic anemias. Specifically, let's just write this down, intra vascular hemolytic anemias, also known as extrinsic, uh, extrinsic uh, causes of hemolysis. Now, in intravascular hemolysis, like we said, you're going to have a significant decrease in haptoglobin, and this is going to be directly uh, due to the fact that it's going to be exposed to blood. Uh, the hemoglobin is going to be exposed to the haptoglobin directly, uh, and it's going to lead to circulation to the liver. And then in uh, extravascular hemolysis, you're going to have normal to slightly decreased haptoglobin. That is not a main finding you're going to see. The decrease in haptoglobin is going to occur in intravascular hemolysis. The reason why you're not going to see the extravascular hemolysis is because this hemolysis occurs in the spleen, so you're not going to see the haptoglobin hemoglobin com complexes forming. And with that being said, we have covered majority of the stuff for hemolysis. In our upcoming lectures, we're going to be discussing the general causes of hemolytic anemias, both intrinsic and extrinsic causes, aka intravascular and extravascular causes. And um, don't while you're here, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. You can follow us on social media at mad.medicine for Instagram, at it's mad medicine for Twitter. And you can find these lectures on your favorite podcast service for free. Just search Mad Medicine and we'll pop up.